Rollerball, a deadly, brutal sport of a nightmarish, futuristic world, an arena of blood and sweat with many casualties. Released in 1975, James Kahn plays Jonathan E., a state champion of the game Rollerball, a roller derby arena of senseless violence where two teams must try to capture a silver ball. Although Rollerball may look like a science fiction sports movie, it's actually a deep philosophical look into a dystopian future and explores government control versus free will. As Jonathan Nee has become such a popular Rollerball star, the head of the energy corporation who runs society wants him to retire. But when Jonathan refuses, things get increasingly deadlier, where Jonathan finds himself in a fight for his life. Rollerball came out just two years before Star Wars, and like most pre-Star Wars movies of the 1970s, it's dark and gritty and shows a terrifying glimpse into a what-if nightmarish world. So buckle up and get ready to enter this deadly arena as we look into 10 things that you didn't know about Rollerball. Let's bring it! Number 10, based on a short story. Rollerball is in fact based on a short story called Rollerball Murder, which was first published as a short story in Esquire magazine in 1973 and was written by William Harrison and would subsequently go on to get published in novel format with other short stories. The short story is very similar to the movie. It's about a violent dystopian future where Jonathan E is an aging rollerball player who starts to question his place in the world as the rollerball game keeps evolving and becoming increasingly violent. With the story more about his internal struggle, with the character explaining, all things I am and own because of rollerball murder. Harrison would go on to work his story into a screenplay to which United Artists agreed to distribute the picture. Not forgetting, of course, the theatrical name change from Rollerball Murder to just Rollerball. Number 9, Filming Location Despite the fact that Rollerball is set in Houston, Texas, the movie was actually mainly filmed and produced in Munich and London. The arena where Rollerball is played was filmed at a sports arena in Munich because of its circular design which the film crew were able to dress up and look like a futuristic sports arena. The Energy Corporation was filmed at the BMW headquarters, which is also in Munich. External shots of the Palace of Nations in Geneva were also used. And despite the fact that we see the Houston Rollerball team travel to different parts of the world playing in different arenas, it was all filmed on the same location. Only the sets were dressed up differently to make them look different. And for the scenes where the rollerball battle takes place in Tokyo, flyers were sent out to local hotels asking for people of Asian ethnicity to appear as extras in the movie, to which hundreds of extras turned up. Number 8. Director's Influence Rollerball was directed by Canadian director Norman Jewison, who also directed Fiddler on the Roof, Jesus Christ Superstar and The Hurricane, and when it comes to the dark, foreboding, futuristic feel of Rollerball, he took inspiration from Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange, in terms of how the movie is shot and showing a world of concrete and still, along with the use of classical music. Of which, Rollerball's main theme is Jonathan Sebastian Bach's Ticata and Fugue in D minor. Jewison also claimed that the classical music was also influenced by fellow Kubrick movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, which features many classical tunes, as Jewison felt that using classical music would help the movie to not age with the passing of time. Just like A Clockwork Orange, Rollerball shows a dark, corrupted world obsessed with violence and doom and gloom, only with less milk and more extreme sports. One scene that always stands out to me and feels disturbing is a scene where people attending a dinner party run out into open fields with a powerful gun and start destroying trees with it, while being overly joyed and happy about it, until this one lady shockingly realises the damage that she has done and how destruction is now a main source of entertainment. Which kind of sums up the movie. It's unnerving. 
Is it strange that in a weird way I always felt kind of bad for the trees in that scene? I mean, it's not just me, right? It's shot in a way that is sad and tragic that makes you feel sad for them. Number 7. The Casting of James Kahn By the mid-70s, actor James Kahn had become a big Hollywood name thanks to starring as Sonny in The Godfather, which came out in 1972. However, it wasn't his performance in The Godfather that got him the role of Jonathan E. in Rollerball. Nope, that was Brian Piccolo for the made-for-TV movie, Brian's Song, which was broadcast in 1971. Like Rollerball, Brian's Song is a sports movie as it focuses on the Chicago Bears football team. Director Norman Jewison was impressed with Khan's performance and wanted him to star in Rollerball. However, it seems that in later years, Khan has mixed feelings about Rollerball, as supposedly one time when he was asked about the movie and what it's about, he replied, it's 94 minutes long. He also stated that he couldn't do much of the character. Also, in addition to that, actress Anne Turkle was approached to star in the movie, but turned the part down. It's unclear what part she was going to play, but I suspect it was the Ela character who was played by Maud Adams. As for James Kahn, well, I always find it disappointing when actors don't have any love for movies that they have starred in. Especially if the movie is pretty good, which Rollerball is. I mean, as far as Kahn goes, it can't be any worse than Eraser. Number 6. Movie Posters The main poster used to promote Rollerball was this dark but shiny one, with James Kahn looking mean and tough and like he's ready to open a can of Rollerball kick-ass while showcasing his intimidating spiky glove. It's pretty classic, and I like the 1970s lettering. It's typical pre-Star Wars science fiction. There is also this really surreal poster, which looks quite Kubrickian, in which we see a giant rollerball fist coming out of the ground holding the world, symbolising the grip the game has on the planet. And if you look closely, it's taking place during the party scene where the guests destroy the trees with the gun. It's an interesting take on the film. I actually really like the Japanese poster, which actually showcases Rollerball. Yeah, as in the game the movie is named after, which once again features Jonathan's spiked glove. And seriously, these posters really had a thing for that glove, didn't they? They really liked it. The Spanish poster shows Jonathan in a state of struggle while playing Rollerball, with once again the party guests below. But my favourite poster is this one. It's beautifully drawn, it looks interesting and intense, helped by the overbearing red glow, and shows the brutality of the film. Number 5. The remake that faded away. So in 2002, there was a remake of Rollerball directed by diehard director John McTiernan and starring that guy from American Pie as the Jonathan character, now called Jonathan Cross. The remake mainly focuses on the action aspect, going for more of a razzle-dazzle wow factor, to which I feel like a lot of the intellectual themes get lost, particularly the themes of free will in a dictating society. Instead, it feels like it's trying to appease fans of action movies of that time, such as Triple X and The Fast and the Furious. The movie was heavily criticised by critics, with it being labelled as a mess, with it only making $25 million in the box office on a $70 million budget. And it has since slipped into obscurity, proving that some films just don't need to be remade. Also in 1991, there was a sports show called Roller Jam, which was heavily influenced by Rollerball. Number 4. Video Game In 1985, a game came out on the Commodore 64 called Rocket Ball, which going by the cover was heavily influenced by Rollerball, what with it even featuring James Kahn in his Rollerball get-up. The gameplay itself is more or less the same as Rollerball, what with players in a circular roller derby style arena involving capturing a metal ball. I'm not sure if this was an official release or an unofficial unlicensed tie-in with the movie. But however, the gameplay actually isn't that bad, especially if you're a fan of the movie and have an interest in Rollerball. And the graphics are pretty good too, especially considering the time it was made in. And it does recreate the look of the film quite well. I mean, if you're familiar with Rollerball, you know exactly what's going on here. And in 1989, there was a video game sequel to Rocket Ball called Killer Ball, which oddly this time seemed to feature Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> Weird. And of course, in 2004, there was a mobile phone game that was based on Rollerball. One that was actually an official tie-in. Number 3. Sports Show Promotion 
These days, when actors and directors promote an upcoming film, they usually do interviews and appear on talk shows. However, the 70s was slightly different, where in order to promote Rollerball, actor James Caan and director Norman Jewison appeared on the sports show ABC Worldwide of Sports. Yeah, a sports show, where they were basically explaining the game Rollerball and how it's played and its fouls and so on. This was probably done to get viewers up to speed on the Rollerball gameplay, so they will understand the game when they go to see the film. But promoting a movie on a sports show program just goes to show the difference between then and now. Number 2. Stunt Performers Recognised Stunt performers have always been a huge part of action movies, and without their sometimes risky contributions, we probably wouldn't have many of the great action scenes from movies such as the James Bond and Indiana Jones franchises. And Rollerball is the first movie to ever credit the stunt performers used for the film. Which is just as well as many of the stunts in the movie are pretty intense, as we see people fighting and getting thrown around while on roller skates, with many of the sequences even involving motorcycles. So Rollerball paved the way for gaining more stunt performer recognition. Interestingly enough, Mark Rocco, who was an English pro wrestler, was one of the stunt men used for the movie. And despite many rumours and popular beliefs, no one actually died during the making of this movie. Number 1. Rollerball could have been a real sport. If anything, Rollerball was a cautionary tale about violence used as a means of entertainment, and the dehumanising aspects of senseless violence in general. Now, whether or not viewers agree with this sentiment is debatable. However, clearly director Norman Jewison did, and thus he was left a little shocked when several sport promoters had contacted him trying to gain rights to the game, in order to make Rollerball a real sport. Yeah, Rollerball nearly became an actual real-life sport, had the rights been given to the promoters, of course. Naturally, Jewison felt that the movie's true meaning went over the promoters' heads, and thus Rollerball never became a reality. Well, at least not yet. Rollerball, to me, is less of a promotion of extreme sports, but more of a demonstration of the crumbling of powerful societies, like Ancient Rome. Hence, a lot of subtle Ancient Rome style of imagery in the movie. Despite the fact that Rollerball is now just about 45 years old, it's still a pretty badass movie, and gets my adrenaline pumped every time I watch it. The action sequences are pretty spectacular, but to me the action is just the icing on top of the cake, as the true appeal of Rollerball is its exploration of a controlled and monitored society, and standing up against it and choosing your own path. And if you haven't seen this movie, then please go ahead and watch it. Anyway, I'm Minty and I'm rolling on out of here. See ya!